Welcome everyone. I know we got still a few, few people kind of coming in. Uh, just welcome. I mean, obviously this is something that, um, you know, we're all very excited about. We continue with our, um, you know, with our theme on accessibility. We have Marcelo, Claudio, and a whole bunch of people are going to be helping us today. So very excited about this talk. Uh, so I know they're going to be covering a lot more of the details of the talk, so I don't want to go too much into that. But just to kind of give you guys some context for anyone who's new, and if you're new, can you raise your hand or say hi or, you know, just want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, this IXDA uh, meetup and really everything that we've been working on uh, for the last three, four years, um, I think it's, it's amazing to see the community continue to grow. And, and I know that we've had a number of this series, I think, especially now with the influence from both Marcella and Claudio, who are kind of ushering this whole concept of accessibility within our community and really keeping on with the themes that we've been working up, not only with IXDA Miami and the support that we've been having from, from all of you, but also with uh, the stuff that we're doing now with uh, UX and fajitas. And so a lot of these things that we're going to be covering as an organization and more importantly as a community is really the, the purpose is to kind of build onto each other, right? And so we're going to be having a couple of things uh, and announcements probably towards the end of this, um, of this call. But just to kind of give you guys some context, for those of you who are new, uh, the Interaction Design Association, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a global organization. It's been around since 2003, and, and, and you know, there's more than 100,000 members and 200 local groups. We're fortunate enough to be the one from uh, South Florida. You know, we started as Miami, but, you know, we're a very tight-knit community between the three counties. Uh, and really, I think this whole organization exists to help anyone in the field of UX, research, product design, and anything that entails this whole umbrella of, of UX and interaction design. And we're always looking for a number of different opportunities. Obviously, we, we're not able to get together as we used to, right? So the hosting, I think, happens now. We have our, our predefined host of Zoom, <laughs> right? Um, but we're always looking for speakers. And, you know, right now, well, kind of the, the leadership on this, we have, you know, uh, Marcelo, Claudio, uh, myself, um, there's a lot of other people that have been, you know, kind of part of this process from the beginning, you know, founding members, and more importantly, all of the, the supporters and um, the volunteers that we've had opportunity to, to work with and that have been instrumental to the growth of this community. Um, and so really, I think the, the only kind of call to action and everything else that we're going through right now, if you have uh, a talk, if you're looking at ways of getting involved, which I know we have some of uh, our very own Jonathan and other people I know without our community that are going to be presenting today. But this whole purpose is not just about the three of us kind of sharing these insights and, and bringing those things to you. Is more importantly, if there's areas that you have an interest in, if there's anything that you see that's lacking within the community, um, you know, we're launching right now an initiative as part of IXDA and, and uh, UX and Fajitas. And, and I know there's other initiatives around the community as well. Uh, of really starting to identify the state of UX. And so that's what we're going to be covering, I think, in our next meetup as well. And I think this one kind of kicking things off and everything that's been going on with the whole accessibility topics and the prototyping, very excited about it. Please reach out if you are uh, in, in any way involved in accessibility or if you in any way want to get more involved with uh, some of the research efforts that we're going to be doing as a community, please reach out to me, reach out to Marcelo. And with that, I'll go ahead and kick it off to, uh, to you, Claudio. So we can go ahead and get started with the, uh, with the presentation from today. Okay, awesome. Although Thanks. technically, technically, we should, be, we should be having Marcelo kick this off because the next slide is talking about the agenda for tonight. So let me- Oh, you can, you can talk through that. Just okay, talk. all right. So we have, um, that's interesting. Oh, see, let me introduce Claudio Luis Vera. He is the accessibility <laughs> expert for Royal Caribbean, and he is one of the pioneers uh, knowledge share um, uh, of the community. And he, he is my accessibility guru. I, he was like the first domino in, in South Florida to really start sharing uh, the knowledge about accessibility with South Florida, and I really appreciate that. Every, every opportunity that I have, I thank him. Thank you, buddy. So now, thank you. there thank you have you. it, your introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, well, this this is really Marcelo's night, if anything. Like, like he has worked so hard at the prototypes and the content that we're going to be showing tonight. It's awesome. So. Um, we have a pretty action-packed lineup here tonight. I mean, I'm going to be kind of speaking a little bit kind of more to kick off the, the, the problem. You guys still see the, the, the slide, right? 
Okay. Yep. All right. And then a lot of what we're doing is kind of a continuity. It's, it's a continuum where we're trying to innovate on top of other people's innovations. And so what's really special tonight is that we're able to get a lot of the folks who have been innovated, who have kind of been working up towards the sort of stuff that we're doing. And then hopefully some of the folks that we're going to be handing stuff off to in the future. So we're going to be talking a little bit about accessibility blue lines, which is a form of documentation where you can capture stuff as a designer and hand it off to a developer. So we're going to have Jack Nikolai from Adobe, and we're going to have Jeremy Elder from GitLab joining us on this. Um, Marcelo is going to be doing some prototypes. Jonathan is also going to be walking us through some demos as well. Um, we're going to have Abid Virani, and we're going to have Sam Pru joining us from Fable Tech Labs, and a lot to be said about Fable and the sort of user testing that they're doing with panels of people with different disabilities. And then finally, we're going to, you know, from a development handoff point of view, um, we're going to have Mop. Uh, Paiva joining us, and Mop is, is going to have some pretty interesting demos here as well. So um, it's going to be kind of like a double header tonight. I mean, we are going to have quite a bit of content. We're going to have a break in the middle, but it should be a really, really fun and interesting evening. So this was a slide that you wanted, Marcelo. I think we can just skip this one right now. And let's talk about the sort of usability gap that we have, particularly with user experiences for people who are using assistive technology. And this is particularly bad with the web and is particularly bad with mobile, um, because, especially with blind users and screen reader users. So let's talk a little bit about how this gap happens. So I have a diagram here, which is kind of a hierarchy of needs diagram. And it, it's broken into six layers. From the bottom, it says perceivable, and then a layer that says operable, understandable, good UX, great UX, and excellence. So this is kind of describing from a user experience, like the different levels of the sort of user experience that you have. So the most basic level, I mean, it's like, hey, can I read the content? And that would be what would be equivalent to the, um, to the principle of perceivable in, uh, in accessibility. The next level up is, can you work it? You know, is it operable? Can you work with the components? Can you work with the different uh, elements that are in there? So that's the next level up. Now, if you notice over on the right, I've kind of assigned it a letter grade too. So can you read the content um, is, is basically, okay, if you fail with reading the content, you get an F. If your site is not operable and you can't work the forms, well, then really you should get a D. But then there's this whole area of like, does the site make sense? So really like having a site where you can read the content, where it's operable and where it actually makes sense to you, I would say really truly is the baseline of what a user experience should be. And I've assigned that the letter grade of a C. So, Higher up is like, hey, is it good enough that we can brag about it? Let's give that a B. And then if it's really amazing, let's assign that a letter grade of an A. So, well, this is great if you're like a sighted person or you're fully disabled, but if you're disabled, let's just see, if you have a disability, I mean, let, let, let's see where you net out on this. So 98% of the web has accessibility issues where your content isn't fully perceivable. So, I mean, you could almost argue that 98% of the web is in F territory. And if we're in that sort of territory and we aspire just to be WCAG compliant, which means that you can read the content and you can work the site, then really it's like you're an F student and you're aspiring for a D. So, I mean, really we have to aim higher than this. And really where you need to aim higher than this is what I'm referring to here is the usability gap, which is that gap where not only do you have compliance, then your site needs to be understandable, but then you also care enough where you're trying to create a user experience for people with disabilities that actually provides you decent UX 
or even excellence that should win awards. And the sad thing is that here in 2020, there really aren't awards that, um, that really reward agencies or creatives for providing a user experience that is truly excellent for people with disabilities. So this is a huge gap, you know, that's in our industry um, that needs to be, uh, that needs to be filled. So what's the real challenge to this? I mean, like, what are the real blockers to keeping us from being able to address this issue well? Well, what is it that we're lacking? So certainly there's an awareness gap. And I think, you know, outside of the folks that are on this call, we probably won't find a whole lot of designers that really know that this problem exists. Then we're kind of missing an approach for breaking down the problem and splitting it up into different parts. And we're going to be addressing some of that tonight. Um, there are tools that are just emerging for developing solutions, and we're going to be covering a few of those tonight as well. And then finally, we're going to be talking about like, what is the best workflow for collaboration where you can interact with other different roles as a designer, or you can help, um, you know, interact with PMs or do testing. So, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, how that workflow happens as well. So, What's the sort of challenge? Um, I did a demo about a little over a year ago, and we were demoing uh, the celebrity website, and we had a screen reader user come in, and I said to him, like, hey, why don't you show us <coughs> how you would navigate the site and how you would find a trip to Greece um, on the celebrity site? 20 minutes later, he was still fiddling through and working through the site and was no closer to his goal of being able to find a cruise than when we had started. But if you look at accessibility testing and you look at the operability of the site, then it should pass, it should be usable. So the problem with the celebrity site right there is where you have that sort of usability gap happening. So. It's, it's something where you need to go beyond, let's just be compliant with the laws, let's just make sure that we're not getting sued, let's translate this user experience into something that makes sense. So here on this slide, I'm talking, you know, I have the assistive technology challenge, where it's like, how do you translate a two dimensional visual experience into one dimensional audio experience? So one of the things that we do as um, those of us who are sighted, <clears throat> one of the things that we do is we'll glance ahead. So a sighted user could probably take in the screen in about two seconds. And you kind of like going from bear to headline to, you know, to the two different areas down below and you're scanning very quickly. Now this particular screen and this section of the screen gets read in the sort of text that you see on the right. And for us sighted users, we're still cheating because we're looking half the text is in all caps because it's in all caps on the site. And if you're like me, your, your eyes are probably jumping from one set of all caps to another set of all caps and you're still trying to scan the screen. Well, what if we take that away? What if, okay, we take away the caps, we make it one big long paragraph, now, how easy is it to move ahead and scan through this sort of experience? Let's take it one step further. Let's get rid of the line breaks so that we're not cheating. And this is really what a screen reader experience is like. You're basically hearing text in a big, you know, a big long continuum of text. And if you don't have any way to navigate it, it's about as much fun as trying to find where on a cassette recording, somebody said something. So you have this sort of challenge where you're navigating one dimensional audio backwards and forwards. So this creates a sort of design challenge that you know, developers and designers usually don't take into account. It's kind of like, I, I, I almost feel like you know, the, the typical designer response is like, whoa, this is hard, you know, I don't have an answer for you, you know, sucks to be you, but you know, I'm not gonna try to solve this. So let's look at what you would use to be able to solve this if, um, if you were a screen reader user. So you'd have fence posts to kind of jump you forward and backward through this. Um, 
first kind of fence posts that you would have would be headings. So if you're using something like NVDA, you can use an H key and you can jump forward or backwards through the headings. And that gives you like a nice semantic way of doing this, which is great for an informational site. But most of the times where you have those sort of layouts that are like a single column and you just have different sections on it, you know, the designers and the developers don't think of this semantically. They just think of it as like, oh, a block for this, a card for that, a row of cards for this, uh, email subscription thing. But you're not typically using headers to navigate it as well as you should. Then there's also you have landmarks. So for instance, a big important landmark that you have on your HTML pages is the container for the main content. So a screen reader user would not want to hear all the navigation at the beginning of a page, or certainly not over and over again 20 times before they get to the content. So you would, out of courtesy, want to put a skip to main button where you jump to the main part of your content. And then you can do things like you can embed different net menus on your page for instance, and assign them nav or give them a role of navigation so that they're also landmarks through the page. The way that we're most familiar with navigating through a page is going through actionable items. So that's everything that's a link, everything that's a form element, everything that's a submit button, everything that you would interact with. Now, if you go to a newspaper site, or even if you go to the, um, the Royal Caribbean website, I mean, you would be going through literally hundreds of actionable items within a page. So tabbing through that may be a shortcut on a less information dense page, but it actually could be a very, very tedious experience if you're not working it, with it that way. So these are different ways of navigating the content but here we're talking about different ways of speeding up through perceiving the content, okay? Really, when you start getting into the site being operable and the site being able to perform, you being able to perform critical tasks with this, then maybe you wanna start thinking in terms of testing. And this is, this is uh, you know, this is an excerpt, for instance, from the audit that they did on Gutenberg. Um, which is the front end editor for, um, for WordPress that was very controversial at the end of 2018. But what you'll see here is that when it was tested, it was tested on a panel of users with different disabilities and they were looking at different completion rates for being able to perform key tasks. So Gutenberg is the authoring interface for WordPress. So you have two tasks here that they looked at. And I think this is actually kind of like oversimplified. One was, can you create content? And the second was, can you edit content? And overall, you, it looks kind of good, but if you look at task one, which is creating content, um, visually impaired users, 0% of them were able to, to create content using Gutenberg. So that's a problem. Um, even at this, I mean, you could say, well, okay, you have task one, blind users, 66.67% of the users were able to complete the task. Okay, tell me in all seriousness that if you were launching an e-comm site, you would launch an e-comm site where 33% of your visitors could not complete a transaction or where 33% of, of the pages were not picked up for SEL. Like that sort of threshold for failure would be unacceptable in any other area of e-commerce or digital. So what I wanna point out is that this kind of testing, it is incredibly useful for knowing if your application works and knowing if your application works for people with very specific disabilities. So you could test one task with one particular group and see 100%, and you could test a different task with another particular disability, and you can get something as 0%. But this allows you, this kind of testing and this kind, these kind of results allow you to focus a little bit more deeply on how you can uh, correct your app, how you can make those sort of changes work.
And another thing, you know, that I'd like to say is, is that this is very similar to the sort of testing that Fable does. And I hope that they're, you know, they're going to be covering this in a lot more detail. So this is in terms of operability. Now, let's say I've got this wonderful design and I need to be able to communicate it with others. So how do I create a great user experience where they can perform those key tasks? And then how do I communicate the requirements or the behaviors that I expect to developers. Now, those of you who are UXers here, you guys know that like, if you're working with Sketch or you're working with XD or you're working with any of those apps out of the box, it's almost like, okay, they're geared towards a visual design, but you have to rethink how you work with that to be able to have a layer on top of that um, for annotations. So, with us tonight, we have Jack Nikolai, who's thought about this issue, who kind of uh, came up with a whole sort of system for doing this, where accessibility requirements, you know, in his opinion, they're not documented clearly, they're not documented consistently, or in a way that other professionals can either easily understand and act upon them. So how do you solve this problem? How do you resolve this issue? So with us tonight, you know, Jack will go over a little bit of a talk that he's done, which is a toolkit for digital accessibility requirements. Jack, do you want to give yourself an introduction, you know, talk about your own bio, or would you like me to do that for you? And let me, let me remind you to unmute. <laughs> Um, thank you, Claudio, for that uh, a bit of an introduction already. I think I can take it from here. Awesome. Um, and I'll, I'll actually, uh, well, so I feel like I'm, I'm aging myself in, uh, in this uh, group that we have today, but, uh, you know, I go all the way back to uh, getting involved with Macromedia and Adobe products all the way back to things like Flash 3. Um, You're not and, alone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I go back to Flash One, and Marcelo probably has has a good history to him too. <laughs> yeah, so thirty five, man. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I I started designing for digital before the web. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, and so um, you know, I I have a, a lot of different types of roles within um, digital uh, in my background. I've been a designer. I've been an animator. I've been an engineer. Um, you know, in the last uh, several years, I've been a product manager, and um, w one of the one of the things that I was encountering, in particular, uh, when I, I previous to Adobe, I was working for Starbucks as a, a, both a, an engineer, engineering lead, and a, a technical product manager for Starbucks.com and our mobile applications, and we were really starting to em embrace accessibility within our digital products as much as. Starbucks does within their physical spaces. And one of the, th the things that became clear was that there was this communication gap between um, the accessibility requirements and designers being able to communicate, you know, what, what kinds of requirements they needed engineers to satisfy. But actually not, not even uh, just engineers uh, and designers, but um, the, the toolkit uh, presentation that uh, Claudia was showing the, the um, the slide four um, refers to uh, the, that in that talk, I talk about three different ways um, that we can drive accessibility requirements into, um, or drive accessibility into requirements. The first of which is into user stories and then design specs and, uh, and then in test cases. And so in particular, Claudia was talking about um, blue lines and, and I don't know if, um, uh, well, if you want to put up uh, the slide for for your the blue lines there on, on the deck, but um, so one of the things that we began to look at was how can we communicate topics like focus order? How can we communicate information as to um, what assistive technology users like screen reader users would experience or encounter as they are, uh, you know, going through your user experience and um, yeah, and I think that um, Jeremy will actually talk about this uh, next page that's on screen because that's actually uh, him taking um, what, what I was teaching other people about blue lines and actually sort of putting it into uh, a, a cheat sheet and putting it into practice. But so blue lines is by definition uh, an annotation system that allows us to be able to express some key ideas about uh, accessibility requirements. 
focus order, um, communicate things like regions on a page, um, and, and information uh, relevant to assistive technologies, and then really just a general way to add additional notations within an interface. So that really what this is doing is, is um, providing a layer of information on top of a design so that a designer can sit down and have a conversation with an engineer and explain to them all of these aspects about the user experience that previously were very hard to um, illustrate or communicate just verbally. And then these design specs, uh, these annotated design specs were essentially designed to then be a handoff. I mean, just in general design specs are a handoff to engineers already, but a version of the design specs enhanced with these annotations as, um, as then a resource for the, the engineers so that as they are building that interface, they have clear instruction as to what the user experience should be for different kinds of communities. So that's, um, that's generally a description of, of blue lines. Um, we really, it, it really started um, back in the days of working uh, at Starbucks. And then as I moved to Adobe, um, really starting to flesh that out into a more concrete sort of language um, error system. And we've actually um, incorporated the blue line system in our inclusive design training that we actually, uh, that we have for our own employees. Um, so every designer at Adobe goes through an inclusive design training, um, which includes in part um, instruction on blue lines so that it is a part of a designer's workflow um, to be able to communicate these ideas through each of their design specs. That's awesome. So, so are you part, are you part of creating that curriculum for the, for onboarding the new designers and stuff as well? Um, I wasn't directly involved. My, um, my old boss, and, uh, and I say old because he um, moved out of our accessibility team and took the, the role of head of, um, of inclusive design uh, within our, our Adobe design organization. Um, so, so he's leading the charge within the design organization uh, and, um, and it has developed, it's, it's already done, the, uh, the curriculum is, is developed and put into practice. And actually it's uh, it's been open source, sourced or made publicly available. Um, if, if folks want to look up Matt May, M-A-T-T, -T, and then the last name is M-A-Y, uh, if you look him up on Twitter uh, and ask him about the inclusive design curriculum, I'm, I'm sure he would be happy to send you a link uh, because we, we really just want to spread the word. This is amazing. This is amazing. So what was, what was your biggest motivator or what was the biggest challenge that you had, um, you know, that made you want to, want to create these blue lines? Well, I mean, it was really, it was the, really the stated problem. Um, we were really having a hard time getting accessibility requirements when, when you're looking at things like, you know, the WCAG requirements uh, or criteria and looking at things like keyboard or focus order, or focus indication. And how do you take those descriptions and those sets of requirements and make them actionable? Or, or actionable and, and clear right. in a way to someone else to be able, because it, like, you know, I'd, I'd work with engineers and they're like, well, okay, I've read the, I've read the criteria for keyboard and I sort of understand it at an intellectual level, but what do you want me to do? And so, it, you know, blue lines were really just uh, created as a, as a way to bridge this communication gap uh, between the the original, you know, uh, WCAG criteria and other uh, accessibility requirements into things that could actually be made, take, uh, you know, taken action on. Okay. Okay. Where do you see these going or, you know, or is this the perfect segue to, to, to get Jeremy to, to talk about how he kind of like ported this over to a lot of the applications? Well, I'll say one last thing and, and then yes, absolutely. We'll hand off to Jeremy. Um, you know, we sort of stopped. I've sort of had, have had to move on to, to other things. And I've always intended blue lines to be something that other people take the, the bones of, and then they, they continue to build it out for their own use. I've seen this already within our own company where I'll, I'll, I'll ha work with the designer and teach them about blue lines, and then they'll adapt it in, in a way that works best for them within their project or their team. So it's, it's really to me considered as a, as kind of, ingredients um, and you can you know sort of season them from there um, you know ways for example that I, I have seen would be um, additional iconography or additional annotations to take into to account other types of input devices 
like mm -hmm. a, like maybe a head pointer or, or speech um, a, as a way to communicate you know what kind of interaction this design is is relevant for um, and so I would just encourage um, folks to think of the, the original blue line set as really just like training wheels and for you to go in and, and really um, you know make them your own and especially you know when you're taking into account different kinds of environments whether it's mobile or voice interaction etc that, that um, I think there's always some room for for additions or customization so so the open source guy little open source guy inside of me is kind of like you know twitching here going like oh my god you know like because I, I almost want to see a structure for, for other people being able to take this on and build on it, as opposed to potentially having 20 different forks or 20 different flavors of blue lines happening out there. I mean, do you envision that ever becoming an open source project? You know, frankly, I hadn't really, haven't really thought about it. Um, and in part, as I said, uh, you know, I've, I've sort of had to move on to to other things and sort of let the sort of let this out into the wild into the community mm -hmm. um, as really for me was always intended um, and I, I spoke to you in our previous um, meeting this I think this last week uh, about how there was kind of this zeitgeist happening and um, this was going back about four years ago where it wasn't just myself but and I've since had conversations with designers at places like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and we were all kind of talking about this same difficulty and problem. I think it just the where we were in as an industry, we were kind of butting up against these same challenges in terms of communicating accessibility requirements. And so, you know, other other folks like um, Ben Trulove is, is a designer at Microsoft working on the Office 365 suite. And in their, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of their UI, Fabric UI, um, they've built uh, a version of blue lines uh, into their own fabric UI. Toolkit. Oh, wow. And so for me, I already feel like this is out in the wild and, and, you know, is up for interpretation and reinterpretation. Um, I don't really choose, like, I don't really feel any ownership to it. Um, I'm happy to, happy to share and talk about it. And, but I'm right. really excited to see people, what people do with it. Well, this, I mean, it's, it's amazing work and I definitely see, you know, value to it. And, Hopefully tonight, as, as the evening goes on, all of us are going to kind of see a little bit of how that evolution is happening. And, and, and really, if there's anything that I would want everyone to take away from tonight is that it's really open-ended. And it yeah. really is there where we can all contribute it, or we could set up an open source project on it, or we could start documenting a code base on this, or creating you know, a, a project on GitHub for this. So Translating I mean, into other languages, which, which I think as is well. very important. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this is, you know, it's, it's there, it's a framework, it's, it's, it's this little baby that you know, somebody else could, could coddle and nurture into adulthood. So um, definitely, it, you know, that's future directions it could go in. Absolutely. So. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I think that's a great segue to, to Jeremy's uh, 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 talk because that's what he did. He took what Jack, uh, and he's going to explain that. So, Jeremy Elder, thanks for joining us. Um, I don't have any, any slides. The only thing that I have over here is, uh, let me check over here. There you go. So, is Jeremy here? Yeah. Hey, we, hey Jeremy. Got it. That's perfect. Hello. Uh, it's great to, it's definitely great to have a community rally around this. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Thanks for putting it together and publicly want to thank Jack for all his effort and uh, over the years, uh, just kind of coaching me through a lot of this and it's kind of to, to his point, it, it really has been something that uh, we're, you know, we're, we're taking the baton and passing it and creating artifacts and letting others expand on it. And that's really what happened. I met, I met Jack several years ago at an at a accessibility event. And we began, you know, having a side conversation about how do you, how do you take some of these ideas that we were working through in the session and actually translate it to designers? How do you kind of, uh, you know, communicate that and create artifacts that are meaningful and kind of prove out uh, these concepts? And that's really where, where I started thinking about how I could apply this to uh, the team I was on at the time, and uh, many, many are probably in this position that I was in, where where it is more of a traditional handoff. Uh, you're not maybe sitting next to your development team or QA, 
QE. And so uh, what had to happen was you had to create these artifacts to actually hand off and document and, uh, you know, test because when you're not there, you're not sure how these things are going to get built out. And so I really wanted to create something that would be useful for the designers on our team. And that's where I took uh, Jack's initial uh, effort with uh, in, in Illustrator, just creating kind of some of these uh, symbols and, and whatnot for marking up documents and extended them into what our team was, was using at the time, Sketch and then Figma, uh, just to build out a, you know, a collection of symbols essentially that you could easily drop onto your design and then start to you know, kind of propagate these throughout uh, any kind of uh, issues or, or Jira stories or tickets and to really you know, have those as uh, documents to go back to. So. Uh, what you see on the screen is is just uh, it's a snapshot from Dribble. That's the link I posted. Not a not a Dribble promotion, but just just a visual, and it, and it explains it. Uh, and th really, the goal I wanted to do is to have key areas where we where we walk through focus order and tab order and landmarks, screen reader, uh, and other annotations and notes to help designers start to think about these things. And and as I started to do this, I realized that it was it was more of a coupler between roles and it, and it really helped uh, bridge a gap between you know, a lot of these concepts and roles. Uh, so started to think about this from a UX standpoint, educate UX team about how are we thinking about how users are flowing? What's the story we're trying to tell and communicate? And so very early on, you start to think about how would somebody navigate in a linear fashion, kind of like uh, Claudio alluded to earlier. And you know, what's the storyline? How are, how are they seeing this? Uh, and you're able to use these blue lines to really show like, here's the way they're gonna flow. And then when that kind of you know, conceptual model gets handed off to designers, they're able to really take that uh, and apply these and see, okay, I'm not just designing uh, a single screen, it's responsive, there are uh, maybe, maybe there's Flexbox or all these other things that are happening that are messing with the design layout. I'm no longer just designing you know, a set of cards and a grid layout and and whatever else, like I'm, I'm being more intentional in how I'm designing it, how I'm architecting it. Uh, from there, a designer is able to hand it off to Dev and really explain like, this is how the user should be experiencing this. This is how it should be communicated to a user. And all the way to QA, being able to use these artifacts and reflect back on them and say, is this really happening? Like, as I'm testing this, is your intention really carrying through? So the blue lines really allowed us to have kind of a common artifact through that whole process that we could always point back to, always continue to, to update and, and work on like, hey, this isn't quite working correctly. If you, if you did any uh, you know, usability testing or user testing, you, they would be able to come in and say, okay, this is not quite right. You can go back and adjust that artifact and carry it forward. Uh, so it became a way to really kind of champion that thread of accessibility throughout everything uh, and just make it a very purposeful artifact in, in the process. So. Jeremy, what would you think would be like the logical next step for, for where you're taking this? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I would love to see more tooling, have this natively for one, uh, you know, but aside from that, if it wasn't native, you know, more plugins like in Figma, like, you know, here I've got my, I got my layer order. You know what, that's very linear. Can I actually have a plugin that builds a flow based off of a layer structure or, you know, something else, other, you know, around those types of models so that the tooling can kind of help pick up the load uh, and, and uh, do that as well as association with uh, what might the, the success criteria be for this element. How can I quickly couple that together with the design so that when I do hand it off, it's not a constant copy and paste links back to, you know, the docs uh, to tie these things together. That would be great. So I know for a fact that uh, um, the next uh, version of Sketch coming up, they will uh, launch Sketch Assistance, which will more, almost will be like linting for your design. And the idea is that you can set a, a number of rules, like if your layers are not named properly, this system will help you name those layers. So I see what you're saying there is how we can uh, incorporate in our design process ways of creating better naming convention, right? Using uh, like your uh, layers uh, naming to have more intent for 
towards the landmarks. So I think that's that's uh, that's really what what I see that uh, happening. And, and you mentioned it's uh, really cool uh, that we are able to start thinking about that. It's doable today. It's just some matter of a new intention as well. So Mark, uh, Mark, Marcelo and Claudia, I did want to jump back in for just a second to address something that Jeremy had said mm -hmm. that I, I had not uh, thought to earlier. Um, what I what I can say is that we have continued to think about blue lines from a tooling perspective, um, and and part of the reason that uh, you know we haven't released anything up until this point has really been more about the limitations of our own product, Adobe XD, and both its capabilities and what we support within the plugin architecture, mm -hmm. uh, because because we see it as uh, as adding functionality through the architecture, or excuse me, through the plugin architecture. We are we have been getting to a point um, recently wherein the ability to capture the kinds of information and, and metadata that are needed in, in being able to um, to operationalize the, 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 the actions that you do around focus order and, and, and documenting information about assistive technology experiences, those kinds of things are, are um, are now available. And so uh, we are definitely um, exploring uh, that tooling. Um, I, I really can't say much more beyond that, uh, right. certainly because it's there's certainly no timeline yet. Um, but but just to say that, you know, we, we agree that um, operationalizing this, this kind of annotation system and making and, you know, having tooling available for designers is absolutely a need. Um, and so the hope is that uh, before too long, you'll, you'll um, find out about a plugin in XD. Um, and certainly I'll keep you guys in mind as, as we, get, we get closer to that um, and let you know. Thank Please you. Do. We're gonna plug uh, uh, towards the end of this presentation. Jonathan will talk about uh, our next event, which will involve Adobe XD and accessibility uh, challenge. So, great. Thanks, Jack. Uh, thanks so much, Jeremy, as well, uh, for coming out and really uh, providing the foundation and the, the, like the, how this all came about. Uh, Claudia, back to you on the next one. Okay. Hang on. I lost a little bit of my place there. Okay. Uh, okay. Want well, to take control back? Um, no, I'll let you drive for right now. Okay, cool. My poor little laptop is catching up with us. Okay, so let's, let's move ahead. And let's talk a little bit about, you know, there've been a bunch of studies that are out there. And let's move ahead to this one here um, by, that was commissioned by DQ, I believe. And in this, in this one, Nucleus, let's go to the next one, um, conducted in-depth interviews with 75 blind adults to kind of see like, you know, how well does the internet perform? So think of this is kind of like a, a real narrow targeted version, almost of the same study that WebAIM did where they looked at a million different websites and they looked for accessibility issues. You know, they did that with Wave, they did that in an automated fashion. This is kind of like intense um, focus testing, looking at a variety of different sites. So, and what sort of sites that they look at? Let's go to the next slide. Um, they looked at hundreds of sites like presidential campaigns, retail e-com sites, sitting sites of elected political officials, and they found that 70% of those sites had critical accessibility blockers. So we're not just saying like these sites had issues, like these sites had issues that really compromise the very purpose of the website and the very essence of what the website is supposed to do here. So it's like, you know, 70% of these sites were broken beyond repair for screen reader users. Like that's, that's totally unacceptable. And when you start looking at, you know, these are like presidential campaign sites or political sites, it starts also like affecting the ability of people with disabilities even to participate in democracy. So 
why would this happen? I mean, these are, these are sites that are being created by talented people, probably some of the best people in the UX industry. So it's not like, okay, would they just happen to pick the worst sites that were built by these hacks that didn't know what they're doing? And we're talking about real UX professionals building sites, but failing at such a, you know, such a horrible rate. Like there's something broken in the process that they're using to build the sites. Um, what they find is like 66% of blind users, you know, will abandon an e-commerce site in accessibility. Now, this would be unacceptable, like totally, totally unacceptable if this was anywhere else in the population. So, I mean, unfortunately, you know, marketing managers will look at this and be like, well, dude, this is just an edge case, you know, hey, you know, we don't need to be focusing on this. But no, I mean, these, these sort of numbers are totally, totally unacceptable. So the question is, I mean, like, how do you go about fixing them? How do you go about making an e-commerce site acceptable for somebody? You know, because, you know, you, you're going to run into financial losses. You're going to run into the fact that, you know, it's not the legal, you know, the, the money that you're losing is less from a legal point of view. It's really the money you're leaving on the table with a large set, a large segment of your audience, which has a disability, which you don't know about because you don't necessarily know about the sort of transactions that aren't happening on your site. So um, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, how do you go about addressing this? So I think I think what we're going to be doing for, 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 for the rest of the evening is really looking at solutions for this. How do you break this problem down? How do you address this usability gap, this functionality gap? You know, how is it that we can go about, you know, actually building sites that really truly work for people? So Marcelo, let me hand this over to you now. All right. So enough about me. Uh... What do you mean so, enough about you? <laughs> uh, well, really, well, I think uh, I'm just, uh, you know, one domino in, in this long shape uh, form, right? So I think uh, what I learned, and this was about a couple of months ago, we were discussing how to communicate uh, accessibility to, to uh, engineering teams. And Claudio sent me a link, oh, have you seen what Jeremy Elder did? And no. And then I went to, to Dribble, uh, his Dribble profile and downloaded it. And then there was a link to Jack Nicolai's uh, uh, presentation. And I watched the presentation and I was like, okay, let's take a deep breath because this is gonna be a long journey, right? Because it, it was not uh, like, Jack's presentation, and I share the link on on um, on a chat window. It, it's uh, it's amazing because he talks not only how to annotate the design, but he talks about who needs to be involved, the user stories, and how it needs to be written with accessibility in mind, uh, wireframing, and bringing uh, uh, copywriters or content designers into mix to, to make sure that they, they're, they're writing proper labeling. So this is really a full-fledged uh, opportunity that we should all uh, take right now. And if you're not familiar with the ship left uh, uh, term already, uh, is uh, how do we bring accessibility from the, the, the remediation stage that, that we see right now towards left in the design process and the product life cycle uh, for that matter. And I think that's uh, where um, uh, that's uh, a couple of weeks, uh, uh, you know, Martina and I will, will be exploring that, that, that opportunity. How do we do that? And I want to demo, uh, do a couple of demos just so everyone understand how someone using assistive technologies, shop uh, Amazon.com, right? Uh, when I came up with that question, I was like, yeah, how does he do that, right? And that's when I started doing the research and was, wow, that must be really difficult to, 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 uh, to buy a book, right? And, and 
and go through the checkout uh, uh, pattern. So let me, let me try to do that. Uh, I'm assuming that you can see my entire uh, desktop. If you're not, please. No, I can see your demo slide. OK. Um, and I'll tell you right okay. now, this, OK. So this will involve uh, me turning the voiceover, which is the screen reader, uh, the native screen reader for the Mac. And in this case over here, um, I have the, the a Chrome window. Typically, uh, you see, you don't see many people using VoiceOver with Google Chrome. It's usually VoiceOver with Safari. I can do that as well if you want. But I think the, the, what I want to demo today is, is um, how, how the, the, uh, the non sighted users using assistive technology they shortcut the bad designs that we produce. All right, so let's uh, let's go to Amazon.com. Okay. Like typically, uh, when they land on a page, I'm going to turn voiceover on now. We should be able to hear uh, the, the the electronic voice coming up. And the way you turn voiceover on, at least on the Mac, is just do command F5. Voiceover on Chrome, Amazon.com, online shopping for this slide is skipped. Person added. Link. Okay, so because I am sharing uh, the screen with Zoom, we may get some some noise uh, trying to capture some of the, the, the accessibility that, that Zoom uh, graciously uh, uh, implements. Um, so, but could you hear the voiceover uh, sound? Perfect. Okay, good. So right here, I'm on, on Amazon.com and uh, typically what we learned from, from the, the, the accessibility uh, toolkit that, that Jack made available is for us to think through how uh, someone with, uh, with no mouse and no screen, uh, for that matter, uh, would navigate through a site. And I found this plugin, which is called... Uh, Entering finder, enter link, skip to main content, turn open menu button. Chrome has new win. Marcelo, we didn't catch the name of the plugin. Yeah. So the name of the plugin is uh, turn lights off. And turn off the lights has... Turn off the lights, right? So uh, the way you do is you just click on that. I don't think it's going to work now for, I think that's because of Zoom. So, but basically what I'm trying to do here is to blank the screen, just so I don't see where I'm navigating. Right? I'm trying to, by no means, I will never uh, experience what uh, someone like uh, uh, Sam Fu uh, does on a daily basis. But what I'm trying to do here is trying to uh, create some intent, just so when we design this, we can apply Claudio Vera to everyone. Isn't access turn off to the this site a daddy oh pendergrass song? <laughs> okay, we can't do chat while you're doing this. We'll yeah, get to because, the Exactly, because <laughs> Zoom is kicking in. So, but let me just uh, uh, click on Group. the page. And the idea is that uh, there are some shortcuts that um, an, an assistive technology user. Form can. controls menu. Michael Sweet has left the meeting. Okay. No items in Red Spots menu, Landmarks menu. So you can see how uh, they navigate these pages through the, what they call the rotor. This is the menu provided by, by the screen reader. And the way you navigate that, you just bring in with, uh, with a shortcut and you, in the case of VoiceOver, but MVDA and JAWS, they all have the same functionality. And what, what's doing over here, it's using the browser accessibility API to surface the content that's on the page. So in this case over here, you can see that I have the land, landmarks uh, uh, page uh, or menu, and I can navigate Navigation. through the regions of, of this layout. So I have navigation on top. Search. I have the search region, which contains the search input. Main. I have the main uh, layout that has all the, the, the cards. I can also navigate uh, this the site 
through the heading. Articles, so, window, spots, links, menu. Or links, right? I can go through. Link, skip, link. visited, link, Amazon, right. link, skip to main content. Right. So uh, if I am navigating through this and I'm not, look, uh, I'm not able to see the interface and just listening to this, I need to search, like if I want to check on my orders, right? You could uh, stop typing. Lo loading link, your, your account, link. 10 items. So if I type in your, it filters all of the links that I have on this page, and then I can start. Visited link, your orders. Your orders. Link, your account. Your account. So it's announcing uh, uh, three things here. It's announcing. Visited link. Your orders. Visit it. That's the state of the, the link and the label of that link. So it's telling me you, you have visited this link and this is a, a, a hyperlink that you can click on and the label for the link. So this is really all the ingredients uh, and it's not hard. If you think of, if you really try to design something with accessibility in mind, it's not hard. It's a matter of putting all the, 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 the puzzle piece together and putting some intention to it and documenting that properly to, to engineering. So this is how I see that we can actually shift. Jonathan Montalvo to everyone. Turn off the lights Open menu button. <laughs> Thanks. Chrome has new window. <laughs> I'm turning the, the voiceover off. Keyboard brightness dimmer. <laughs> And, Boy, if ever and there was Alexa a way to in all sizes, Zoom Chrome has new window, <laughs> voice over off. Yeah, voice over off. All right, so this is, this is another, another, another uh, uh, point that I want to make is that the same way we have a visual uh, cognitive load, right? Uh, they also have that cognitive load of content in their listening. Right? So uh, I think this is something that 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 we should think through when we, we design interface when we we uh, create this the solutions is how do we make it simpler? Right? How do we make uh, with intent well descriptive? Go ahead, Claudia. Right, it, like like a lot of us sighted people will look at a page like Amazon and we come away from this with a mental model and expectations of how the page is going to work based on visual design. Like I'm really curious as to the screen reader user going into this, you know, yes, there's a cognitive load of verbosity, but is there a mental model or is it really more like the cassette tape where you're just fast forwarding and rewinding through this very long one dimensional string of text? Right. So I want to take the opportunity because I know that Sam Pru is here and Sidan, maybe Sidan is still here. I want to give them the opportunity to, to make a comment right now because yeah, this is in. where, yeah. So please feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, you're welcome to make your comment about uh, what you've seen so far and if you recommend an additional piece. Which, by the way, all we're presenting tonight is not something that it's not a proposal, right? We're all learning together. I think that no one here is pretentious uh, to know that uh, or to call ourselves uh, uh, accessibility experts. So we have so much to learn and we're still learning how to build uh, 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 good experiences. Uh, you know, let's create an inclusive uh, uh, experience for all. Right? And this is part of uh, our learning journey. Yeah, so Siddhant here, uh, am I audible? Yes, thanks Siddhant for joining. Yeah, thanks, thanks for inviting actually. Yeah, so you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm actually uh, running a accessibility related setup uh, out here in, in India. Uh, so the way we kind of started out there, like a quick brief is that uh, I was associated with this NGO wherein they looked after the higher education of visually impaired students after their schooling, wherein there is no, not much of an educational support in the mainstream college, uh, like the uh, higher education system. Um, and through there, then we kind of had a group that was coming together, learning computers and stuff. And then eventually a uh, few of us kind of ventured out into the accessibility arena. 
so that's how we kind of started uh, and uh, I, I met marcelo through uh, one of the assignments that we kind of got engaged in uh, related to the uh, presentation today and uh, I, i'm quite lucky to be part of that assignment and eventually land up here in this session today so uh, this is uh, uh, I, I like that concept of blue lines. I really want to go through how it really kind of uh, unfolds itself. So um, may, I was actually thinking of drafting an article so that uh, many people come up with these questions, you know, who, who are uh, wanting to implement accessibility, trying to say, what are the first few things that we can take care of instead of fixing it after the thing is built, how, how we can kind of get it uh, fixed right when we start you know so those sort of things i think blue lines is probably on the same lines is what i kind of conceptually understood out here so something that i'm looking forward to about the uh, amazon.com um, demo that you showed marcelo uh, one of the important things that really becomes a, a, a hurdle in e-commerce sites is that they'll have offers okay uh, the offers banner will kind of have be running up there and most of the e-commerce sites will have a pure image banner uh, for the offers wherein we won't even come to know what's the discount uh, happening today you know at this point of time on at certain products so probably someone else makes a, a, a buyout uh, whereas uh, we are probably not even aware that offer is there right so uh, uh, on most of the e-commerce platforms, I've seen uh, everything else they'll try and make accessible, but they'll miss this one thing out, you know, uh, just for that day. Uh, because these are very short term uh, posts that they are not uh, probably running through the entire cycle, maybe. And for that day, uh, the, the banner is inaccessible. The rest of the site, they have probably made an effort because the application sits there forever. Um, but the banner sits there for just a day or just for a few hours. So, uh, but but it's it's one of the things that's uh, uh, pretty much uh, I'm, uh, like users like me would be interested in. Like, if there is an offer, why 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 should I be left out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so, curious so. to see how you find your offers. Uh, how do you how do you usually find those offers? Uh, like you just try to, to find the, the office category and then go through and go through the list? Uh, no, generally see what kind of offers generally set up on that homepage in the banner, right? So we try and mm -hmm. uh, actually if I'm on a touch phone, I'll just try and place my finger on the uh, uh, banner and then I'll kind of try and figure out. But uh, moreover, the offers thing uh, is notified when a notification drops into that uh, phone, you know, in that notification drawer up there. Uh, and only the description up there can probably help us know that, okay, there is an offer going on. I need to take this up. The moment I click it and open it up, many, many e-commerce, like even uh, uh, no, there is there is this uh, pharmaceutical based mm -hmm. uh, set, uh, app I just downloaded last week. And uh, they said that there is a discount running through. Just have a look at it. I was like, okay, great. Let me just see. Uh, I want to buy some st uh, medicines and stuff for my baby, the supplements and all. So I kind of opened it up. The first thing that opens up is a model with a pretty flashy looking image. And uh, then I'm trying to read the offer details. No, the, everything is an image. So I'm like, okay, forget mm. it. Uh, let's not buy it. I'll uh, look, right. up, look it up in some other place, you know. <laughs> right. No, thanks for that. Uh, Sam, do you wanna do you wanna uh, chime in here? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, all right, I, I think I can be heard now. Um, yes, perfectly. So uh, I sort of wanted to talk about that question um, that you had asked: Is the experience linear linear for me, uh, like like listening to a tape recorder? Um, and and the answer is definitely not. Um, for a web page that is semantically laid out, the screen reader hotkeys, as well as the speed that I keep my voice at, really allow me to and make it to my benefit to have a very good mental model um, of, of pages that I use often. 
Um, if you guys are, are open to it, uh, I'd, I'd love to uh, share my screen. And uh, I'm, I'm in Canada over here, so it'll be Amazon.ca, but I'm sure it's much the same. Uh, and, and sort of give you a, a demo of how I would normally uh, look for a product kind of at full speed uh, without you know, using a slower voice or, uh, or, or any of that uh, kind of stuff. I think that would be amazing. Can you do that in five yeah. minutes? I definitely can. Okay, let's do that. Uh, uh, Claudia, you want to give him a host uh, uh, preview? That's right. Make you co-host. Yes. And and Sam, I'm gonna I'm gonna become a, a user researcher here. Could you uh, uh, speak uh, uh, out loud what do you do in order to share your screen? Uh, yeah. So I mean, I'm just I'm just uh, in, you in stop the yours, Marcelo. Zoom window. Uh, and I'm I'm uh, going over to screen share, and uh, pressing the share screen button. Uh, put up a message that this will stop other screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, I do. Yes. Uh, so I'm Kick going to make sure and check the checkbox that says share computer sound, uh, and share my entire screen. And here we go. And I'm going to move us over into my Amazon window. And you should now be able to hear my screen reader as well as see my screen. Correct. So what many screen readers do when a page is first loaded is they actually start reading uh, the screen from the top and sort of continue reading it continuously until the user presses the key. <laughs> what many advanced screen reader users do, or even intermediate screen reader users do, is turn that off. Because obviously you can understand that there's very limited utility from just reading a page from top to bottom. What we're really interested in doing is using our hotkeys and the semantic model of the web page in order to jump around very quickly. So what I'll often do, I'm on Amazon.com right now. I know I want to buy something. So I'm going to press one key, jumps me directly to that search box uh, without you know, having to read or interact with anything else on the page. Uh, I'm a little bit hungry. Uh, I'll, I'll search for some cookies, see what, uh, see what we can find here. It tells me the page is loading, uh, still loading. Uh, that might be a problem with my, oh, there we go. It's loading complete. We have the search results. So now all I need to do is jump by heading because I have a, a model of this page that I know each search result is marked by a heading. So I can mm -hmm. very quickly look through, find what I want. Oh, hi, that looks good. Press enter on it. Again, the page is going to load. And, and I can just sort of like skip right to the button. I know there's a button called add to cart. And I know that add to cart is always a button because that, you know, it's a, it, it's I a, have a question on this. Page. Yeah, go for it. Um, so this, this is the product detail page and it usually has multiple images of the product. Um, I'm curious to, to learn from you is do you ever try to listen to the description of the photo or what do you look, do you already know this product? How do you, how do you navigate through the review sessions? How do you pick, how do you know this is the best product that, that, that you are shopping for? Um, so, I mean, of course, the first thing, I'm jumping from title to title, so I'm looking for something that, uh, you know, I, I know that I'm, I'm actually interested in buying. Uh, and now that I'm on the product page, uh, again, I can go from heading to heading until I get to a heading that says product information. And then now I'm in the product information heading. I can go ahead and put the cursor down and I can find all of the technical details that are laid out in a nice table so I can find out what the product is called, who, who manufactures it. Uh, I can find out kind of the, the, the ingredients. Uh, I can find the product description. Uh, and so I don't actually look at the product images. I'm more interested in the textual information. So that's under ingredients, that's under the product description. Again, I can keep going by headings and very quickly find the customer reviews and, and jump right to them if that's what I'm interested in. Uh, okay. But like I generally don't uh, kind of explore the, the image carousels uh, because it, even if they had alt text, like I'm, I'm interested in the product description, how many, how many grams are in this package? Uh, what are the ingredients? 
uh, all of that uh, kind of stuff. And this is actually one of the reasons that uh, digital shopping is is more accessible and 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 can be very empowering because I don't have to, like I was in a store, depend on somebody to read the packaging for me and say, oh, well, maybe I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. How many calories does this have? Whatever. Uh, right. if, if the web page has been laid out accessibly, it's all there for me. Good. This is great. Thank you so much, Samuel, uh, for, for showing us this. I'm sure you, you've cast many sites and Sam will, will come back to, uh, to explain how Fable Tech Labs actually uh, uh, does uh, user testing with, uh, with uh, people with disability. Uh, yeah, they definitely test for a couple access. of jaws hit the floor <laughs> while we over the video on this. <laughs> with the speed, with the speed of the the voice, the the jaws. No, no, our jaws hitting the floor. I think. Oh, people okay. I'm <laughs> by this. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's it's very very quick, and I and I did want to sort of sort of emphasize that right that I I don't I don't think of a site as as a linear string. Or, or if I do, it's because the site hasn't, hasn't been designed correctly. I want to think about headings and search boxes and landmarks and things like that. Uh, anyway, just give me uh, one minute to stop my, my share here so you guys will, uh, will hear my, my uh, screen reader as I get over to that button. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Wow. Thanks for that. So yeah, I really appreciate this. So like this kind of, a, now we have the two sides, right? We have, the engineering side trying to to uh, to uh, design and develop, and then we have the, the end user side trying to understand what we we uh, we produce. So taking a segue, we have um, I'm not gonna pause. I'm just gonna keep going, Claudio. Otherwise, uh, we, we're gonna hit the, the 9 p.m. and we're not gonna be able to. Okay. To go All right. So basically, what we did over here. Uh, we took um, a, a demo, an accessible um, e-commerce site that uh, Publicis Sapien uh, made it available for demo purpose on, on GitHub. And we took the challenge and said, okay, let's, let's see how accessible this thing is. And I was going to, to, to share, but I already shared uh, how, how we would test uh, an interface like this with uh, with the screen reader, but basically the challenge was uh, that for us, uh, able designers are trying to understand what we do and not trying to, to use the, the, the accessibility uh, blue lines and, and the way in finding the tabloid. But in the process of doing that, we came up with a new way of uh, uh, getting to that final design. One of those is the announcement card. So even before we begin designing the interface, we can uh, think through uh, a storyline how any user would buy them, right? So it's like almost bringing uh, the, 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 the storyboard before you start sketching the, the scene, you just write down the script. Right? And you think through the journey of the user. And that exercise is uh, usually uh, uh, is thrown away, right? So, but we can take that, we can think through uh, what the interface uh, can, can uh, inform the, the user. And we take that and start putting the piece together because that's the editorial, the, the content that you will need uh, later on to label your uh, interface properly. So and just by really uh, going through uh, understanding a little bit more about what the accessible rich internet uh, application or area uh, properties are, um, it's, uh, it takes, it, it's kind of an ingredient. It takes the element, it takes the state, and it takes the label. A label could be a link uh, describing, I mean, the text describing the link, or it could be a label associated with an input uh, uh, element, right? So in this case over here, I have an example, right? You take the recipe element row, and then you have state, and then you have label, you add that up, and you, uh, you have the, what the screen reader will announce, right? In my example here, 
uh, I have element, link, state, new, label, learn about us. And the screen reader will uh, omit the new state and will say link, learn about us. Right? That's really the, the ingredients that we need to know. Uh, obviously, uh, we can go over the access the, the, the accessibility blue line, obviously we need to think about the focus order. This is a piece of information that the engineers uh, need because if you're not using the mouse and you tap through your, uh, your, uh, your keyboard, uh, you're just gonna focus from, from uh, element to element and only the interactive element. By using area uh, uh, properties, you can actually augment the HTML elements and make those elements possible. Right. Um, talk a little bit about landmarks. Uh, as you saw uh, when, when Sam uh, 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 navigated through, through uh, Amazon.com, the first uh, uh, region that, that he focused on was a banner, right? And then he tapped through and he, he went to the next landmark, which in Amazon was the search one. So these are information that's, that's really important uh, to annotate for the engineers. Now, here's the really important point. If you are an interface designer and if you're using Sketch or Figma or Adobe XD to put uh, your interface together, you are usually grouping uh, these elements, right? And as you group, you can take the moment to rename those groups as you would think those regions should be called, right? And this takes, uh, uh, it really takes a village. Uh, you need to, to uh, be in a cross-functional team. You need to start uh, the conversation with uh, the front end developer very soon. Uh, you need to bring in the, the copywriter or the content designer to think about the nomenclature that you're gonna be using. Uh, so in this case over here that I have on my screen, I have a search input, uh, which is in blank, and a search uh, button attached to, to that element. Is there anything else that I should be uh, announcing to, to the user? Could I uh, augment this, uh, this region with something, hey, you can search for 3,000 uh, products. Uh, and by the way, we have offers, right? Make sure you add some keyword and you get a list of all of our offers. So I think that's uh, how do you think through these new uh, uh, ways of navigating and improve the experience not only for, for people with disability, but for all. Uh, in essence. Um, just going through uh, 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 the accessibility blue lines over here. So you have the green annotations on your interface would uh, describe how the, the assistive technology would announce. So in this case over here, you have a name, a role, and a state. And it will read for this button over here, if the button is collapsed, we'll say filters collapse button, right? So like with that recipe, you are telling the user, oh, it's a filter button and it's collapsed. If I click on it, it will expand and it will say uh, filters expanded buttons, right? And it will, if there is a group associated to that button, um, it will say, oh, there are four items and it will announce which item is checked, right? As you might be able to do that. It's really like a very good way to, to uh, think through the accessibility uh, uh, requirements and, and stuff publishing. Now, what we did last, uh, uh, last week when I was in, on PTO, I, I had the opportunity to spend time with uh, Jonathan, Claudio, and my son, Mark, and we took the, the Sapien e-commerce site. And we started thinking about different ways that we could improve 
the, the assistive technology uses navigation. We came up with this, this idea of, oh, what if we uh, create some application role and we add some key shortcuts uh, and we announce those shortcuts to uh, the user. And I'm not sure if it's gonna work, but let's, let's give it a try. So this is us being designers, right? And, look, and we'll test it. And that's how I came uh, uh, to, to meet Sudan because we, we prototyped this and we actually, we tested with Sudan and Sudan could not go through the, those, uh, the application role on the shortcuts. Um, and that quickly say, oh, that's not a good one. So let's continue with providing a good semantic uh, uh, structure to the page because that's really how they, they navigate. <clears throat> And this is really the exercise that, that, that we did over here. So you can uh, outline the regions that you would like the, the user to jump uh, to, uh, from and to, right? And you see here, uh, the top header is a banner. Inside the, that banner, you have search regions, product categories region, store uh, region with um, accounts and, and, and shopping cart links. And then you have breadcrumbs region, you have a filter panel. There is a region and you can enter and navigate through that panel. So you're providing them with some, some really uh, good uh, landmarks in the page for them to navigate through. So you can see on the footer, you have recommendations uh, of other products related to, to uh, your previous search. And you obviously you have the footer region with some legal and about us content and feedback. So from this point on, what we did is we took that region and we started uh, uh, working through that and created a new mental model. Or well, what if uh, really uh, think about the, the regions as a stop at a train station. When you stop at a train station, you are announced where you are and if the door is open and what is the next stop. It is really a, a quick, simple way to, to have us uh, think through this new mental model and understanding uh, how we can uh, create semantic layouts for, for accessible uh, interface. And this was, uh, I'm sure what I'm showing over here is just like a, a natural map, kind of a subway map with all the possible stops of the UI and you have banner as number one. So you go the express lane is, uh, is, is it navigates through the regions and then you have the local train that goes through each uh, element on the screen. This is really good. For, for us to annotate, to think through this and document in a way that you can bring in the content designer and start writing the, the announcements for each stop. Um, like, um, so once we have this, what I'm showing now is thinking through the, those stops and knowing that on each stop we're gonna have to announce uh, to the user what those announcements would look like. And that's where, when we start thinking about how to prototype this, even before we have the interface, right? And Jonathan will talk uh, more about that. Uh, let me pause over here. I think that's, this is the, the flow that, that we did and we generated a couple of others. Let me go back to my, my uh, presentation. And I'm probably gonna have to go through this. So, um, so while while you're loading that, Marcelo, I just you know, let's talk about this. So there is like the slow path where you're logging through all the content, or like on mm -hmm. an e-com site like Amazon, you probably have like, you know, a hundred links on a page. So that's kind of like your your local. But on the other hand, if you have, you know, heading structure or landmarks to work with, I mean, that's really your way of zipping around and not having to endure the slog of the page. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is that 
we don't we don't realize that as we are building uh, an interface and tools like Sketch or Figma, we always end up with you know dozens of pages and hundreds of elements on each page, and we uh, uh, we have to group them. We have to organize them in a way. We have the opportunity to name those elements uh, appropriately. So I think that's where uh, we have the missed opportunity. And that's what we're encouraging everyone by showing this that you need to stop and name that layers properly first. That's, that would be the first step. But even before you start designing the interface, you could collaborate, you could do some user research uh, with people with disabilities to understand how they would navigate your product to understand how you can improve their experience. It's really taking uh, of accessibility from just being compliant according to the, to the uh, WCAG guidelines. It's really providing a much better inclusive experience to, to everyone. Uh, any questions? Uh, I, wanna, I wanna start opening up for questions, start answering some of uh, 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 this. So I'm showing over here is just like one slide with some poster cards uh, that we can start exercising announcements uh, before uh, designing the interface. And these are uh, things that as you start talking through the user and going through the user journeys, you can start creating these uh, cards with the intent of uh, assistive technology. Always bring in what is the 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 row or the element is is a heading, right? So it's a page title. It's a heading with welcome page, and what's the state if there is one, right? Way to shift left on this, Marcelo, because I mean, really, you're 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 bringing a lot of this thinking, you know, into the point where you're doing your journey mapping, you know, it's uh, you know where you're starting to think in parallel, okay, what's the, what's the experience that a sighted user is, is having? But also, I mean, this would allow you to also start thinking of like, how does assistive technology play with this, you know, at, at a very, very early stage. Right, yeah, indeed. Uh, I already went through this, this slide is showing, I'm describing, uh, giving some and Sam uh, uh, presenting, um, attending. So I'm describing this slide as, just like laying out the, the interface and outlining each region and putting your name on it. Um, the train stations, the announcements uh, at each uh, stop. And the design and developer collaboration is really important. This is where I'm going to pass on to Mark and he will uh, uh, discuss the, the spreadsheet that we put together to help us collaborate this information. This is, this is great because you can also bring other folks into the mix, not only the design and development. Um, I, I would just like to pitch in here for another like aspect. As, as we are talking sure. about the state uh, roles and uh, the namings and stuff like that, uh, uh, a lot of effort has gone into, uh, in a way, kind of uh, uh, putting out the commonly used components and uh, the W3C's uh, Y area group is kind of documenting it out for us, uh, trying to even, like, let's say, like uh, ease out the design patterns that we should be kind of implementing. Uh, but to add on top of it, there are also many uh, uh, aspiring to like uh, 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 components that kind of come up wherein wherein people can see charts and the timelines and uh, you know maps that can be clicked on uh, the SVG oriented maps with D3 oh, yeah. and stuff like that so yeah. even there uh, 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 um, I think this this kind of a modeling pattern, uh, as I understand the railway stops kind of a thing, is going to help us set up our own custom roads. So I don't know whether people are aware, but uh, if there is something called as a role, which already the accessibility uh, 
uh, attribute set kind of provides us. If you have, want to have your own custom thing built like a SVG map and stuff like that, there is ARIA role description that kind of helps you put your own custom roles and custom uh, implementations uh, or the semantic that you want to convey across, you know. So I think these are few extra things that we can really uh, look into. And when we come across such new types of components, uh, give it a fresh thought. Uh, just just for an example, uh, activate voiceover on uh, the, the uh, iOS device. I remember having looking through this. And there is this feature within the clocks, you know, like the alarm thing, wherein they create a chart of your weekly sleep time and wake time. And just try and navigate that char uh, chart that they created. Uh, it's it's amazing. Like, I mean, the kind of user experience a chart can give you, uh, a bar graph can give, give you. It's, it's uh, simply amazing to just uh, have a look at, uh, rather try to navigate it using voiceover on cool. iPhone. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm really glad you brought that up, Sadan. Um, that like the practice of using these these roles and uh, these RA roles to describe these custom widgets that uh, designers are designing and developers have to build. They should be building them using these roles so that the these uh, blind users who are using screen readers can actually benefit from these widgets as well. Um, yeah, it was awesome point, Sadan. So let me share my screen here. Can everybody see the slides? Yep. Yes. Awesome. And so, yeah. we, do have, we do have one question, I think, just from uh, Charles. you want to do those um, now? Do we address at this point, or do you want to wait till the end, Marcelo? Let's, let's try to, well, let's listen to the question, and then we'll try it's to. Just, to it's just, I think it was on the same topic that you were covering is, have you ever started uh, with priority guides? I think it was one of the stuff that we kind of went through. Priority guides. Um, I don't think I'm familiar with that. Charles, if you're there, can you elaborate a little bit on your question? Uh, yeah, so Marcelo's demonstration showed um, basically the starting point would be thinking of the page conversationally. Yeah. Um, and and what, uh, what it would be if the orientation of the author of the page um, considered it a, a conversation or a dialogue. Uh, there's another starting point, which is called a priority guide. And it's basically a zero fidelity outline of the content of a page. And when you use it in an outline format, it actually aligns to all of those landmarks and roles and, and HTML structure that it, the page is going to end up with anyway. So it seems like it, it could work well with the approach that you have to have an alternate to, starting point. Can yeah. you share a link with uh, uh, Charles? Uh, so definitely I'll look into that. I know that uh, Ultima Software, we've been practicing narratives uh, a lot, uh, even before uh, when creating the, the requirements, we really try to, before we do the journey, we try to create a conversational um, narrative uh, about how someone, considering the, the, the contextual uh, environment that they, they are in, uh, if it's too noisy, if it's not. So what is, what is, what are we trying to understand, right? So yeah, I would love to, to understand more about the, the priority guides, uh, if you can share the link. And while we're on the topic, Charles, I know you'll, um, any relation to, uh, to Erica Hall? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm connected to her, but not related. Oh, okay, got it. So for, for those of you on the on the call, if you guys want to kind of get more of those insights in terms of starting with conversations and kind of leads into a different topic of more of the kind of conversational design, but I think very interesting in terms of how you guys were able to kind of map that out. So there's a really good book by Erica Hall called Conversational Design on that. So cool. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Hey, Mark, do you want to share the, the, the sheet and go through that? Yeah, sure. So... Here. Yeah, so um, when you're communicating uh, accessibility to developers, the, the, the most important thing you can do as a designer first is really um, take all of these steps that we've been talking about and really go through and figure out what, what are those regions, what deci we decide on the, the tab order with your developers and 
um, the semantic order and making sure that the, the visual order of the page matches the, the semantic order that's being received by the, uh, by the screen reader. So the, when they navigate that, when you look at that, the, the model of the, of the Metro map, you see all of the, the elements in sequence, they should be visually in that sequence as well from cool. top to bottom, left to right, when you're looking at the page generally. Right. We put, to, we put together like a spreadsheet to help us work. Then Jonathan came in, Jonathan do the prototype and he was able to, to take the content and add to uh, Adobe XD. So I'm more curious, Marcelo, do you, you want to share the, the spreadsheet? Just in lieu of time, we can yeah. uh, uh, and pass on to, to Jonathan. So here's the spreadsheet. So basically, these, this is uh, columns. You can describe them up. Yeah, so this is kind of like a, a master spreadsheet for all of the accessibility information that a designer would need to pass on to a developer. Um, it's like a very um, condensed and bare bones version of the, like the blue lines that um, Jeremy and, and uh, John were talking about. Jack. Uh, not Jack, not John. Um, and yeah, on the first column, we have the stop ID, which references the, the Metro map ID in that Metro map model. And um, it has the stop name that's associated with that as well. But then it, has, it goes into describing the computed role of the element when it's on the page, uh, like what it will be announced to the screen reader as the role of that element, the actual element being used in the code, uh, any extra ARIA state that needs to be added for any custom widgets like uh, Sedant was talking about. Like if you have a, uh, a navigation button that has a pop-out menu, um, you want that button to have has pop-up and uh, ARIA expanded to explain that it, that it is either expanded or not expanded or has a pop-up. Uh, and then it goes into um, describing all the, the labels. So you see there's four columns that describe the labels in green, uh, ARIA label by, ARIA label, your text and thumb label. And these are in uh, a specific order because there's a specific hierarchy to how these labels are applied. Like you'll see at the logo home, it has an ARIA label and an inner text. But when the uh, a user uh, reaches that, um, element in the screen reader, they will only uh, hear the, the label that has the highest priority. So they will only hear that ARIA label and not the inner text. Um, so it's really important to know what that hierarchy is and make sure that you're putting your most valuable information to the user in that higher, mo in the most relevant uh, spot in that hierarchy. And then ARIA described by will add additional information that comes after that label in the screen reader reading. In yeah, future that's presentations, we will, thanks, Mark. In future presentations, we're going to be talking more about area uh, attributes and, and just to teach the community a uh, uh, step further, right? Jonathan, do you want to go on and, and uh, talk a little bit about how and show demo us what you were able to do with Adobe XD? Yeah, no problem. And, um, and after that, I'll talk about uh, what we're going to have for the next uh, meetup and touch on some cool things that we're going to be doing for that. Yeah, uh, before that, I would lo love to, to hear from Abbott and, and Sam uh, about user testing uh, for accessibility. Sure. And then we can wrap up with, uh, with next month. All right. So cool thing about XD, um, you can do a lot with prototyping. They got keyboard triggers, voice prototyping where you can speak in and cause an interaction or you can get voice responses and even uh, create um, uh, like sound um, annotations when you, you know, make an interaction, giving you an audible response, which is pretty neat. But this is what we kind of put together using the same uh, framework that Marcel Welcome to AccessibilityStore.com, e-commerce clothing store for women and men. All right. So when I hit a keyboard trigger. Header, navigation landmark. Please select P for product selection, S for search, C for user submenu. Continue selecting tab to navigate to up. You are in the filters landmark. So I can select C for colors, S for size, P for price range. It's giving me direct. You are in the product sorting landmark. There are three fields to sort by. Product results. 
header I come back navigation to nav, landmark and i hit p product categories there are four options use right arrow key to navigate through women's men's girls and boys press enter for menu options current selection women's collapsed menu men's collapsed menu and as i navigate girls collapsed menu boys collapsed menu i can go back men's, to men collapsed menu press enter men's menu expanded there are five options tap the down arrow key to navigate through options men's tops men's pants men's shoes men's hats and uh yeah that's pretty much what we kind of put together really quickly just to demo what xd is capable of doing with uh, accessibility prototyping Right. Thanks, Jonathan. I think this is uh, obviously uh, it's welcome not... to AccessibilityStore.com. Clothing <laughs> store for women. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Got it. So I think really. Uh, so I think we have we are at a, a point that we definitely need to start uh, asking more from from uh, the desktop publishing tools and, and interface designing tools to give us more plugins, more features that we can actually start uh, really bringing accessibility towards the left. Uh, like uh, uh, Jack mentioned, I think the Adobe XD is definitely, uh, we try, we try other tools, we try a number of plugins and none of them would take us where uh, Adobe XD was able to to take us uh, today, and obviously this is an industry that changes frequently and rapidly. So um, I, we should assume that there will be more and more features coming up. Uh, one, one, I think one feature that I would ask Adobe is just can we uh, uh, put a variable for the speed of of the the, the, the voice because it's maybe too slow if we want to put that in front of a, a blind <laughs> user, maybe too slow for them. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great feature request and I will, uh, I will pass it along. And actually, um, I think this is publicly available. Uh, Adobe XD uses user voice um, and it's one of their main ways that they collect, uh, I'll pull up a URL here and put it in the chat. Um, it's one of the main ways that they collect, you know, input from users and requests and, and requests can then be voted up. Um, and they, they heavily use this site to help influence which new features that they pick up. And so I would definitely encourage folks uh, to take a look at the user, user voice site. So I've just added a link to it in the chat and, uh, and, and to, you know, to, to send around a link to whoever wants to submit the, the request and, and vote it up. Cool. Before we go to questions, thank you so much, Jack. Thanks, Jonathan, as well, and Mop. Uh, before we go to questions, uh, Abbott and Sam, can we talk about Fable uh, Tech Labs? So we've been talking about Fable for, I think, the last uh, uh, two events. And this is a, a company out of Canada, and they are doing an amazing job and work with uh, amazing companies to really bring, um, uh, raise the volume on accessibility experiences, so accessible experience, if you will. Hey, welcome, Abbott. Hey, thanks a bunch. Um, this has been amazing tonight. Uh, I'm having a great time and it's nine o'clock and I'm exhausted and I'm sitting here <laughs> at my screen, like uh, observing every moment of it. Um, uh, if you don't mind sharing the deck, we added a few sure. slides to do it. It'll be helpful. I'll share that. Mm -hmm. You know, to kick it off, um, thanks Siddharth and, and Sam for bringing your perspectives into the conversation. It wouldn't be nearly as rich if you didn't. Um, so like I'm learning a bunch tonight. I appreciate how open this exchange is. I love that we have like a, a Figma demo with the e-store and then um, we're talking about Blue Line. We're talking about Matt May's work and, and others on the inclusive design curriculum. Um, that was some new stuff that I just saw from XD and, and honestly, that was, that was pretty fascinating. Uh, what's exciting to us about all of this is that accessibility is this massive problem 
and that there, there can't be a single solution or approach. It's the, the success of the, the accessibility ecosystem is what uh, needs to happen. And, and that means that within it, amongst the people who are here tonight, like the most important thing is, is not just tips and suggestions, but discourse, disagreement, uh, different approaches, different perspectives. And Fable's trying to be a player in that. We definitely are trying to address what we think is one of the bigger problems today, which is um, actually having access to the skill sets that people with disabilities have. Um, we start to get into the real usability questions when we do that, that usability gap you talked about. That's what opens up when we bring those perspectives in, which is, you know, how far apart should those train stations be? Um, how do we make workplace communication so efficient that a person with a disability is at no disadvantage uh, to their peers with whom they compete with? Um, so uh, that's, that's what we're all about. That's, that's why we're in it. We're trying to pick one problem in the ecosystem and address it. Um, I've, I've been dreaming about doing something that was uh, a good business and social for a long time. And, and that's what drove me here. Um, you've met Sam, but Sam, why don't you introduce yourself outside of Fable and, and tell folks uh, who you are and, and what brought you here? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, I'd love to. Um, so I have uh, been uh, completely blind uh, my entire life, uh, but I also have a bit of a unique experience uh, in that my father, uh, is also completely blind. Mm. Uh, and he worked uh, at IBM for over 30 years. And so not only did I have a, a father who, who shared my blindness and who I could really look up to uh, as a role model, but I also do not remember a time when there was not talking accessible computers around me, uh, you know, sort of from, from the Apple IIs to DOS to, to Windows. And so it was, it was made very clear to me as I was growing up how life-changing accessible technology was going to be and how life-changing it was and has continued to be. Um, and and as, as part of that, as I spent a lot of time online, I sort of recognized the extreme power and importance of communities and of bringing people with disabilities together to have a voice, to have discussions with one another and to exchange tips and things and to empower each other that way, but also to have a voice and, and to, to speak to others uh, and, and to work for change. And so, um, you know, that sort of uh, led me in, in a very direct way uh, to what I do at Fable as, as our community manager, uh, recruiting all of those um, people that we work with and that we give our, our customers access to, to do testing uh, with because what it's, it's about making sure that people with disabilities have that seat at the table and are part of these accessibility conversations and are part of this accessibility work because that is so important uh, in order for, for change that is really um, world shaking it to be made. Thanks. Um, if we could bump forward a slide, uh, the term inclusive design has been thrown around a bunch tonight. Oh, sorry, an another slide yet. Um, the, the term inclusive design has been mentioned a couple times tonight. You know, our, our perspective on this and drawing from the same bodies of work that, that Matt May does and, and the Inclusive Design Research Center here in Toronto. Uh, we firmly believe that people with disabilities don't need to just access the web, but need to build it. And, and that's very much at the core of what we do. Uh, and so the most important thing to know about what Fable does is to know about our, our community, our, our workforce. Um, and so we could just bump forward another slide and, and Sam, maybe you can just tell us um, what is the Fable community? Uh, and, and hopefully we can just jump forward one more slide. Thank you. Yeah, so, so 
our, our community is a community of folks, all of whom are people with disabilities uh, and who use assistive technology as part of, uh, you know, as, as a full-time necessary part of their lives. Uh, and not only do they use it, uh, but they are, are skilled at using it uh, because, you know, skill in using assistive technology is something that it takes time, time to learn and it takes time to develop. Um, and, and when you're working with users who are familiar with their assistive technology and skilled in using it, it means that the feedback that you get when you're doing this kind of work is the best that it can possibly be. Um, and, and our community, of course, is, is made up of folks like all over Canada, all over the United States. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we use all kinds of different assistive technologies, all kinds of different screen readers, screen magnification, switch systems, voice control, all sorts of things, uh, and, and are at all stages of life from like university students working on their degrees to retired professionals who, who are looking for a little bit, little bit of extra work. And, and that diversity is such an incredible uh, strength when, when you're doing this kind of work, uh, because, you know, as we've said, um, accessibility is ongoing, it's incremental, and it's a, a discussion. Uh, and, and, you know, there's not necessarily a one size fits all solution to some of these problems. I think you bring a, a great point. So it's not only uh, uh, the fact that we have inclusive design, but we need to start bringing uh, um, uh, folks with uh, all, all different uh, disabilities to help build these products. And I like the, the marketplace is really missing uh, the, the, the audience, right? And um, there are a number of initiatives that, that we've been discussing to help uh, uh, bring people with disability into the marketplace faster and with a, a better approach and a better objective to, to better experiences as well. Abed, I'll, I'll, I'll answer and I'll pass back to you. And we're almost at, at time here. I want to give uh, uh, the opportunity for some folks to ask a few questions. Yeah, and, uh, we'll, we'll hand it back over to you. I mean, Check Out Fable, it's, it's crowd testing. It's on-demand access to people with disabilities who want to help you build dig better digital experiences. Um, and, and that's what we do. We're trying to hone in on that. We're a young company, just a couple of years old. Um, but we, you know, we, we think that this is the most essential part of building good, accessible user experiences is having the ability to engage people with disabilities in that process. Uh, and uh, we're trying to just make that fast and efficient. Um, sure. Can you tell us uh, a little bit in, in uh, what type of uh, uh, products do you test? And how do you test them? At what stage? What type of fidelity? Uh, yeah. Those tests are? Yeah, and and like let's talk about prototypes. So we, we definitely test, you know, built products. And and there's lots of folks who uh, have their QA team leverage Fable, um, but we also sell directly into research teams. And you know we work with some fantastic teams that build prototypes, test those prototypes, and we haven't figured out yet how to best recommend prototype testing specifically for screen reader users. So if we, if we jump to the next slide, one of, one of the features in Fable is doing a prototype review where you get an hour with the user, um, but we've specified that it's a screen magnification user, a voice navigation user, a switch system user, and we're, we're leaving screen reader users out right now um, from the prototype review stage because we haven't seen it achieved. Uh, and so tonight has been like incredibly valuable. Um, and for ways of practicing, how do we get feedback from folks leveraging screen readers to navigate the web? Um, like I think, I think Fable's super eager to help get over this hump, be it collaborating uh, with, with the folks building the tools or with the researchers coming up with ideas to test out information architecture. Um, we're, we're really eager to see that happen, but we basically work a lot with research teams and a lot with QA teams. 
Um, but the research teams can interview screen reader users, can collaborate with them, but uh, prototype reviews has this little filter in front of it. And, uh, and we would really love to get rid of that. Uh, so whatever can be thought up in this room and in other rooms, like we're all ears and we'd love to contribute to the conversation. <laughs> right, how early do you think uh, Fable could help any team? Um, I mean, we, we believe in the research process. So to be honest, like before you scope, um, right at the beginning, uh, we find that having a couple of voices, people with disabilities, allows you to imagine a product that's more adaptable and more customizable. Uh, it benefits everyone, but people with disabilities require it. And, and the earlier you hear that, the, the more adaptive and customizable your products are gonna be at the end. Cool. Yeah, hey, this is uh, Peter McNally. I have a quick question. I know it's almost time, but could you use the, uh, it was Jonathan gave a demo of XD and could you like customize the command so it kind of mapped to a screen reader, whether it's JAWS or voiceover? Yeah, I think we, we got the same question there too, Peter, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was certainly an, an exciting, exciting demo uh, on on my end um, uh, of of that prototype, and I, I'd love to um, explore that further. We, we were talking about this in the green room before we started the presentation, and one of the things that we're kicking around is like, okay, sure, we could prototype this, but you know, could a sighted designer, you know predict accurately what a screen reader is going to read. And then it was like, well, you could solve that with like templates and stuff. So that, you know, if we had a template, for instance, for NVDA or a template for JAWS and how it's going to read the page, then we could actually start constructing the prototype around how the, you know, how that content is constructed properly. So it kind of takes the fear um, from the designer or the prototyper of, of getting it right. You know, it gets rid of that fear. This is Jack Nicolay. I wanted to just jump in here because we've, um, one of our computer scientists has actually done quite a bit of um, exploration as far as these kinds of voice prototypes and, um, and mimicking uh, screen reader interactions or at least uh, approximating them. And I'm gonna try to dig up uh, some of the, 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 often he'll create a video demo of what he's exploring and I'm gonna try to find an example of those. I recall in some of our conversations that he was running into some limitations in terms of mapping um, directly to uh, commands, you know, that would be typical for screen readers just because of some keys that were reserved um, in the prototyping view. Um, and so I, I don't, I, I, I think you will, you will find that you might not get quite to a one-to-one -one, um, Certainly some things will work, but I, I think, you know, ultimately these prototypes will still be approximations. Um, and, and I think that we just want to keep, keep that in mind in terms of how we introduce these prototypes in, uh, to the users that we're, you know, we're looking to get feedback from. Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's similar in that, you know, you might use instead of, um, uh, instead of a, a working prototype, you might use a paper prototype. Which is kind of you know cheap and dirty, or quick and dirty, and 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 is an approximation of these things, and you sort of talk talk through it via a narrative. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know we may still, um, well, I think we can get close. But I think that's okay because that happens in the visual world. You know, you use like you know Axure or whatever the tool is to approximate a real website, and you you know you know you tell the user up front this is a prototype; it's not real yeah. yet. So I think that that could work. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Any of you guys using uh, Wizard of Oz testing when it comes to voice at all? Where you, you kind of simulate, you have a hidden a person that will read off of a script, but you simulate as if someone's interacting uh, with the actual. Um, right when it comes to voice like a, would, you would that, uh, the the wizard of oz person really have to know the screen reader inside and out you know that you could do that yeah but that would be you'd have to have someone i think who really knows the technology really well but that could work 
it would certainly be uh, something something interesting to to try. I know it's uh, it's something that we've we've had had thoughts about and haven't had occasional sort of sort of conversations about um, at, at Fable or like if, if you were going to describe a prototype to a screen reader user, how how you would describe it um, in a way that we could give real feedback about its design and accessibility as well. Yeah, I, this is Jack again. I remember seeing a presentation. Uh, at the CSUN conference a uh, handful or two or three years ago, um, some folks from, from Target, uh, at representing target.com. And it was a, a, a gentleman who uh, was blind, uses a screen reader and an engineer uh, slash designer. Um, and they worked very closely together in their colla in, in, in collaborating in, in terms of uh, what you were just describing, Sam, in terms of like the, the, the engineer would and designer would describe the user experience and, and to some degree speak to the, 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 what the screen reader would voice and, and they would work together sort of iteratively that way in, in working through the uh, user experience. Mm -hmm. Very cool, any, any additional questions? For the, for the young designers, uh, well, we are, we're all young tonight because we're all trying to learn. <laughs> Who you Who likes being called young? <laughs> uh, any questions? And so maybe, Jonathan, do you want to talk about the uh, next month's event and the design challenge that we have? And yeah, before we do that, let me, let me make sure that I give Abbott and Sam the proper way to, to close uh, uh, his, uh, his slides here. Where can we find you? Uh, how busy you are right now, and uh, tell us uh, how to uh, contact you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch it in two ways, actually. So our, our website's there. It's makeitfable.com. Um, we're very busy, but in a fantastic way. Um, we just posted four or five new job postings, so um, I also just want to, like, bring note to that. We're, we're growing as a company. Uh, we're looking for folks who are inspired and eager and want to build a, a social enterprise that, that solves a real business problem. Uh, so if anyone's interested, whether to have us as a vendor or to work with us, uh, feel free to check out the website or find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, all the usual things. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank awesome. You. And I hope I hope we have a chance to have you guys back here again sometime soon. You know, so yeah. we, can have a, we can have a fable night and really get into the weeds with, with testing and stuff. There are yeah. weeds. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so one way that we are trying to expand this event uh, is really trying to to have uh, uh, someone that can provide a, a sign language like uh, and transcripts and so I really appreciate the way uh, the Accessibility New York uh, uh, events are handled. Uh, I look up to them a lot and I encourage everyone here to, to uh, attend those events as well. So I really see uh, hope that as we grow our community and we create more awareness on how to create uh, accessible experiences, we also tailor to invite uh, people with disability to these events like that. So as you saw tonight, so we learned a lot from Sidon and, and, and Sam. So, uh, Jonathan, you want to go next? Yeah, pass me the, the sharing rights. Yeah. Uh, or you could do should, it. Okay. Oops. Yeah. So, pass, uh, so basically, um, you know, since we've been on the topic, I reached out to some of my friends at Adobe on the XD team. And uh, they approved to join the next meetup and uh, we told them we'll have a design challenge specifically based on prototyping for blind users using XD. Wow. Um, go to the next slide. So nice little big collaboration between I IXDA and Adobe XD. As for the speaker, next slide. Still don't know who that is, but I will find out shortly. We have a month to go. So I'm working all the kinks out and planning with uh, Liz, who's uh, one of the reps at uh, Adobe XD. She's going to provide me with someone to, uh, you know, speak on prototyping in XD specifically for blind users. And uh, I'm sure Jack can help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> Bring Jack on the line. <laughs> Look it up, Jack. Uh, next slide. 
<laughs> so based on that design challenge, uh, you know, everybody wants Adobe swag and that's what they're going to give away. So we don't know what the swag is yet. Um, I'm hoping it's socks because if any of you win those socks, I will be knocking on your door and stealing them from you because I want some <laughs> really bad. Um, but yeah, Adobe swag is the giveaway for, for the winners. I'm guessing top three, top five prototypes. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the challenge we've been kind of coming up with, and this can change, and I'll make sure I update with everyone, but I'm pretty sure it may just stick to this, is prototype an accessible login pattern for blind users using XD. Uh, so, you know, key kind of interactions using keyboard triggers, voice commands, voice playback, audio playback. Uh, it's up to you how you want to go with that, but just kind of follow the rules based on what you learn from this speaker at the next meetup. Um, next slide. And just some simple tips here. Consider your user. They are blind. You will not be judged on any of the visual design whatsoever. Um, and, you know, see if you can uh, accomplish the login task by testing out your own prototype blindfolded. Why not, right? And okay, so let me, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be sharing that where Flux, yeah, on LinkedIn. How are you going to share the, the design? Yeah, I'll be posting it on I'll be posting it on LinkedIn. They'll also be um, posting the meetup on the letsxd.com site on their mm -hmm. events page. So we'll, you know, we'll house it there and we'll also house it on the meetup.com page and we'll have a thorough description there as well. And, you know, just kind of blast it out all over social media. All right. Uh, Joe, can I bring you back? And, yep. and uh, I'm sure you have a, an announcement, Claudia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, lots of stuff, <laughs> lots of stuff going on. I mean, I know we're kind of running a little long. So if anyone has stayed here, I guess are, are troopers, but we've had a lot of uh, really interesting events. And obviously, I think from IXDA, a couple of announcements, right? Aside from all the stuff that we're doing on the accessibility front, as you guys know, um, last month, we also kicked off our initiative on state of UX, right, in South Florida. And as also a lot of you know, we kicked off an initiative on Flux Hours. And so I think this is interesting because I'm going to be bringing on board someone here shortly who kind of reached out to me through that effort, right, of, of basically how can I actually add to the community. And, and I think today was a testament of how many people um, are a part of this vibrant community, uh, the different types of organizations that are now collaborating, the influence that obviously uh, Marcelo, Claudia had kind of brought into this, uh, you know, into this vibrant community has been amazing. And I think a lot of it is understanding where we are, right? And, and one of the key uh, patterns that I think emerged from today is that everything is so new and we, we're trying to figure out, and that's us that are basically living and breathing this every day. But one of the biggest gaps, as you talked about, Claudio, uh, so eloquently on like that, that, those different types of accessibility gaps, the different gaps in terms of um, employment and things that are going on right now in our community. And so part of this whole initiative, both on the accessibility front that we're doing with IXDA, and the state of UX uh, in South Florida, I think they're intertwined in many different layers. And so um, one of the, uh, the initiatives that we're working on right now on that front and, and kind of stem from really someone reaching out to me and say, hey, do I do research? How can I be involved with this? And we're basically putting together also a white paper, which I know Marcelo, you and I have been talking about for quite some time now. And really more so than just kind of putting all these pieces together, this white paper is just to understand the, the state of UX in South Florida, and uh, I'm going to be bringing on board here, uh, John, who can talk a little bit more about the work that he's been doing and some help that may be needed on that front. So that's what I want to use this announcement kind of portion to, to kind of highlight some of those pieces. So John, are you, uh, are you here? Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, hey, great. You want to tell, tell us a little bit about some of the great work you've been doing and just briefly, I know we're kind of running a little late, but just a little bit about all the, the amazing stuff that we got planned and where you're going to be yeah. meeting here shortly. Well, you gave a great introduction, so there's not really much else to really say, but, uh, but basically, uh, yeah, uh, my name's John. I'm a researcher. I recently moved back to the area. I was working in Portland for a while, but I'm originally from Miami, and I just wanted to know how I could give back uh, to the community, and Joel brought up this great idea of uh, a state of UX white paper. So basically, what we want to do is kind of gauge um, where the UX uh, kind of, where UX kind of is in Miami-Dade County and in Broward County and South Florida overall um, from a business perspective. So where are businesses in terms of in, you know, implementing user-centered design in their everyday practices and their structure, whatever that might be. So there's gonna be uh, a lot of opportunities to help. Uh, I'd actually really like to have um, a lot of kind of uh, um, 
kind of collaboration from the community. So uh, some of the research activities that we're going to be doing that there could be help on. I'm, I'm working on a competitive analysis right now. So if anybody's interested in that front can help out. Um, later on, we're going to be doing uh, some survey work and some interview work, especially. So especially for interview work, if anybody is a designer or interested in research, wants to kind of get their feet wet with uh, doing interviews, this would be a great opportunity to do that. It's going to be a great opportunity for anybody to improve their interview skills. Um, and uh, also there'll be some probably opportunities for like infographics and other sorts of, uh, you know, deliverables, reporting kind of work as well. So um, any of that sounds like something you'd like to help out with, uh, you'd like some experience doing, um, definitely reach out to me. I'm going to put my email in the chat here. You can also reach out to me on Fluxia. I'm on there. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, um, it's going to be one of the things that I'm going to do is it's not, I'm not just going to, if, if any of that is kind of strange to you and you're interested in doing it, one of the reasons this is going to be a great opportunity is there's definitely going to be a lot of opportunity for mentorship of those skills. Um, I'm going to be offering to help anybody who is a part of this initiative who wants to get involved with, you know, interviewing. We're going to do some training, some other sorts of things. Uh, there'll probably be some other senior members of the community helping out. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, just don't be afraid. If this is, this is a great opportunity for you, zero risk to just jump in and help out. So um, yeah, anybody who's interested, reach out to me. I'm going to put my email in the chat and also you can reach out to me on Flux. Yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, back to you, Joel. Thanks, Joel. Awesome. John, what, what is your last name? Just so we can find you on Oh Fluxia. yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll put that in the chat too. I'll put my name and my email so you can find me. But yeah, my name Great. is uh, John McLeod Moya. Um, so I'll be putting that in the chat. Um, any other, anything else I miss? <laughs> no, that's it. I think, you know, as we're going through this initiative and, and Claudia, this is one of the things I think we've been talking about getting other people involved. I know we're looking right now in terms of um, the different levels of maturity, but if at any point, especially given all the initiative we're doing right now in research, we want to add some questions on accessibility to see where they rank. I think this could be one of those opportunities to basically continue to build on where we are really, right, as a community and what can we do kind of bridge that, um, that gap that we have right now within not only the, the whole companies and different enterprises. This is but great. This what's is happening what right we've now. been trying to do for, for <laughs> years <I know>. now, Joe. <laughs> flux, listen, flux hours, right? So this is, this is kind of what, what develops from it. So this is good. See, that's great. This is awesome. <laughs> you know, I, I also don't want to make, you know, we, we've had some amazing guests here tonight. And, and, mm -hmm. and yes, I'm not even just saying just the folks that have spoken here. I mean, we've had some amazing you know, so, so some people I really, truly respect in the accessibility community, you know, accessibility professionals that have joined us here tonight, folks from India, folks from Canada, folks from Chicago. Uh, we have, you know, Charles here, for instance, who's, who's on the advisory board for uh, the W3C. You know, I mean, we've got some amazing brain power that's come here tonight and joined us. You know, so I want to say a huge thank you to those of you who have come and joined us from outside of Miami, you know, given us your evening and come and join this community. And as you can tell, it's a very friendly one, a very open one. And I just want to say thank you claudio and marcelo because you guys kind of spearhead all of this man you guys put in a lot of work you guys are good mentors and good people and i appreciate both of you no thank you no th thanks everyone i think this is this is what we've been doing for uh four years now right joe and and yep. claudio so it really uh uh really trying to to give back what one day we learn from someone else so I think it's a matter of you carrying that, that baton uh, uh, forward. So with the same uh, uh, type of practice and knowledge sharing. So thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jeremy Elder. Thanks, uh, Abbott and, and Sam. It was uh, so delightful to, to have you all come in and, and, and show us uh, uh, the same passion that, that, that this, this community uh, have really appreciate. I feel like we're expanding this community and beyond where we are, but definitely like this, this one of the, the great things that, that we are uh, getting from, from the moments that we are living. So I think we are expanding and meeting more people somewhere else that is more like-minded. Uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. See you guys. Awesome. Thank, Thank you guys. You. All right. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll hang out for beers, yeah. uh, whoever wants to stay on. So we usually stay here and have one last beer after recording. <laughs>